Let's open our Bibles tonight to the book of Leviticus. If you notice your outlines, we're down to the bottom of page 6. We've given you already the nature of the ritual in the Old Testament worship, the place of worship, meaning and symbolism of the sanctuary. We're under part 3, the content of Mosaic worship. We've dealt with the origin of sacrifice, the central idea in sacrifice, gave you a definition. Well, tonight, Hebrew sacrificial terminology. That's on your outline as far as the terms are concerned, so we won't be, I guess, spending time spelling those. Now, it's my tendency to want to skip this part, but I've been requested not to. It's going to mean something to you when we get into the sacrifices proper, because the book of Leviticus is really the most important book of the Old Testament. The reason I say that is because it's filled with Jesus Christ, and all the sacrifices, the ritual, priesthood, everything points to Jesus Christ. Most people have no knowledge at all of the book of Leviticus, not even the Old Testament, let alone the book of Leviticus. And as we'll see a little later, in the book of Leviticus, it attests to its own inspiration more than any book in the Bible. We'll get to that later, but just scores and scores of times, it's the direct word of the Lord to Israel. You see, much of the Old Testament is history. It's inspired, but the book of Leviticus, if you're talking about inspiration, it's thus saith the Lord all the way through. We're going to watch the outline pretty closely here. The Hebrew sacrificial terminology. Generic terms, which means general, and then you'll notice under B are specific terms. Now, with respect to the terms, I'm just going to give you brief definitions of what all of these sacrificial terms mean. And then when we speak of them later, you'll understand them. Then when we get on to the classification of the Levitical sacrifices, we will give you an understanding in analytical form of those. The Old Testament is a closed book to most people, and especially the book of Leviticus because of the complexity of the sacrifices and the holy days and so forth. We want to make you a better student of the Bible by dealing with this. And I don't know anywhere you'd get it because even if you could find a dictionary that would deal with some of these terms, they don't give them all to you or don't deal with them systematically. And just to read the book of Leviticus, it'll talk about the burnt offering in chapter 1, then again over in chapter 17 or something, you see. So this is putting everything together. The first term that we look at, generic term, is the minka. It's spelled there for you, M-I-N-C-H-A-H, the minka which means a gift or an offering. And it's from a word which means to give, to give or to lend. Now the next term is zavak, which simply means sacrifice. It's the Old Testament term for sacrifice, the zavak. Z-E, soft B, B as in Bob, soft B-A-C-H. You see this outline was made up for the seminary and when I taught Hebrew there, we use the classical pronunciation, but what we taught those of you who took Hebrew here at the church is the modern pronunciation, which you have to have if you're going to be up to date and go to Israel. So it's really Z-E-B-A-C-H instead of a V. The V is correct in classical Hebrew because it sounds like a V. A soft B in Hebrew is V, zavak. And a zavak is sacrifice, and it's from a word which means to slaughter either for food or for sacrifice. It's from a root which means to slaughter, either for food or sacrifice. And then the next term on your outline is the ishe. Ishe. I-S-H. S-H-E-H. The ishe. And it means an offering made by fire. Offering made by fire. And it's from the word for fire, ish. And then the next word is the korban. Now that one you'll recognize. Q-O-R-B-A-N, the korban, which means an offering or gift. And it's used to designate all kinds of sacrifices used to designate all the kinds of Old Testament offerings, whether they're blood offerings or vegetable offerings, whatever, a Corban. Now just by way of interest, over in Mark chapter 7, 
and verse 11, we have a carryover of this word, literal carryover, from the Hebrew. You remember when Jesus was rebuking them because of them violating the word of God, teaching the commandments of men? Verse 11, Ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban. Now this is the word in Hebrew. In the Greek, it's K-O-R-B-A-N. In the Hebrew, it's Q-O-R-B-A-N. And it's translated here C-O-R-B-N, but it's all the same word. He says, you say it is carbon, that is to say a gift. He gives the Greek interpretation, gift, which is doran, D-O-R-A-N. Using this Hebrew word, carbon, he says in the Greek it means doran. So it's the same term, doran or carbon. You read that whole passage and you'll understand that he was taking an Old Testament sacrificial term. In other words, they were just calling it a gift and said it's given to God and therefore they didn't have to support their parents. If their parents had need, they'd say, well, I've dedicated everything to the Lord. It's a carbon. You remember the instance. All right, now the specific terms, the olah, O-L-A-H, the olah. The olah is the whole burnt offering. It's a very common term in Hebrew, the olah. It's from a word which means to go up or to ascend. And of course, the whole burnt offering went up in smoke, ascended heavenward in smoke, and that's why it's called the olah. It's called the going up. It's not called a burnt offering. That's our translation. In Hebrew, it's called an olah, a going up. It means an ascension, in this case of the smoke. Now, there's another term, but I won't get into that because it's not necessary to give all the details. And the word W-H-O-L-E, whole burnt offering, means it all goes up, of course. Since it was offered every morning and every evening on behalf of Israel, it's also called the continual burnt offering. So it means the same thing. If you read in the Old Testament, continual burnt offering or whole burnt offering, it's the same thing. Or the daily burnt offering. The next term, zavak shalamim. Now that's from the word, what? Shalom, peace. You know, hello, goodbye, peace be unto you. Or the words are related, it's actually derived from the verb shalem, S-H-A-L-E-M, long E, shalem, to be complete or whole, and so the peace offering meant you were complete with God, that is, in a peaceful relationship. It's from a verb meaning to be complete or whole. In this case, to be complete with respect to your relationship with God. You're at peace with Him. Since the noun means peace, shalom, common word for peace, and it came to be called in English the peace offering. But literally, it's the sacrifice of completeness. It shows you are in a harmonious relation with God, and as we'll see later, that sacrifice, the person who offered it, ate it in a common meal with God in the precincts of the temple. It was a fellowship meal. Something on the order, but not the same thing as, as we'll see, communion, when we partake of communion. The idea is there, but we'll get to that later. The katat. Just mark the H off if you're pronouncing Hebrew, the modern pronunciation. If it's classical, it's katath, like T-H-E, the. But it's katat, the sin offering. Katat is the sin offering. And that's all it's called, the katat. That was the big offering in Israel, the katat. Or if you want the Hebrew guttural, katat. You have to gargle a little with it. The chatat. Chatat. C-H. And it's from the root to sin. Kata. C-H-A-T-T-A. C-H-A-T-T-A. Kata. Which means to miss the mark. The idea of shooting the arrow at a target and it misses its mark. Sin is missing the mark. The standard that God set up for us. That's... The outstanding sacrificial term, the katat. So you want to remember that one. 
The next one we look at is the asham. A-S-H-A-M. Asham. And that is the guilt or trespass offering. The guilt or the trespass offering. The asham. That's used in Isaiah 53 of Jesus. So we'll see later. And then the minka again. That was the first term we gave you, but it occurs here again. It's also a specific term. It's a general term, generic, meaning all kinds of offerings. It's also used as a specific offering, and it means the meal offering, M-E-A-L, meal offering, grain, meal. Meal, our grain, was offered on the altar daily. We'll see why later. It's called in King James, in case you're using King James, the meat offering, M-E-A-T. But it wasn't flesh, it was grain, just the opposite. But see, in Old English, meat meant food. And so it can include any kind. But it's the meal offering, the minka, when it's used in a specific way. Next one on our outline is the nesek, N-E-S-E-K, the nesek, which is a drink offering. And it's from a word which means to pour out. The drink offering, another important offering in Israel. The next one is the Shemen. S-H-E-M-E-N, the Shemen. Which is the word for oil. It's one of the terms used among the offerings and sacrifices. The Shemen, it was the pure olive oil that was burned in the lamp in the holy place, people supplied that oil. Then we mentioned here a libation of water, which occurs in the Old Testament and in later Israel, but it's not one of the sacrificial terms, or it's not sacrificial terminology that was given to Moses. But it does occur in 1 Samuel 7, 6, and 2 Samuel 23, 16. We might notice that first one so you get an idea of what the libation of water is because it occurred down through the centuries in Israel even though it wasn't taught. And yet somehow God must have revealed to them this sort of offering. And yet it wasn't a part of the Levitical offerings because Samuel wouldn't have just done this on his own. They've gathered Israel together to repent of their sins and confess their sins, and we see in 1 Samuel 7, 6, and they gathered together at Mizpah, or Mizpah, and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah, or Mizpah. They drew water and poured it out before the Lord. Then that account in 2 Samuel 23, 16, I mentioned, which is also in 1 Chronicles 11, 18. We won't read that, but there's a case where David said, I wish I had a drink from the waters of Bethlehem. When he was fleeing from Saul, and three of his chosen men didn't tell him, and they went up to Bethlehem, taking their lives in their hands because it was held by his enemies, and got a water skin of water and brought it back to David. And when he discovered what had happened, he said, well, I wouldn't drink Water that men risk their lives to get for me. We're told he poured it out before the Lord as an offering. Now where did they get the idea? It had to be revealed to Samuel and David. See, this is after Moses. It isn't in Leviticus. Our numbers are Deuteronomy, which also contains sacrifices. But it's a part of your understanding of the Old Testament, what they're doing. It's called a libation of water. Then later on in Israel, it was observed, as long as Israel could sacrifice, it was observed with the Feast of Tabernacles, except it was poured on the altar, a libation of water poured on the altar with the Feast of Tabernacles. So if you do any reading at all, you'll run into that. People who don't know think perhaps it's in Leviticus, but it isn't. We don't know where it comes from, but Samuel and David do it. And the Jewish writers, interpreting this practice, said, like a first Samuel we just read, they poured out their heart in repentance like water before the Lord. 
So I would assume the Jews knew the meaning of it, so that seems to be the significance of it. As they poured the water out before the Lord, they were pouring out their heart and their tears of repentance. So it was a symbol of that. Now that's one that occurs in the Old Testament, but it isn't commanded by God. Now the prominent, outstanding Old Testament term is kiper. It's the word translated over and over in King James as atonement. Kipper, Yom Kipper, Day of Atonement. You've heard of that, all of you, whether you know Hebrew or not. Yom Kipper. It's not Yom Kipper, it's Yom Kipper. Yom is the word for day, Day of Atonement. And literally it means to cover over. It doesn't mean to atone because you have to explain that. That's an English word, atonement. It means to cover over. What? The sin. The blood covers over the sin. The blood was always sprinkled on the altar. You see, the animal by itself didn't signify a thing. But its blood signified its death. A life for a life. A pure life for a guilty life. And when it was sprinkled on the altar, that was offering the life to God. That was symbolical of offering the life to God. And so the term kipper means to cover or to make propitiation, it's usually translated, as I say in King James, as atonement. But if you turn to a couple of passages, we'll see the literal meaning of the term. See, all the Hebrew words are concrete, picturesque, but a couple of passages will show you the literal usage of the term, then you'll see that when it's carried over into the prominent, chief, central, sacrificial term, which kipper is, it is the basic term. Then you'll see what it means when they sprinkled the blood on the altar is symbolized covering over sin. First passage is way back at the beginning, Genesis 6, 14, even before the flood. The term occurs, kipper. Genesis 6, 14. And where God told Noah to make an ark. Now you know if you've ever made a boat or ever seen anyone make a boat out of wood, they make bathtubs today out of plastic and call them boats. But true boats are wood. <laughs> wood has character. But these things that are made out of plastic, every time I see one I say, there goes another bathtub. <laughs> it has an advantage, the plastic bathtub is that you can't sink it, I don't think. And you don't have to caulk it. But a wood boat, you have to caulk it. So God told Noah to build the ark, and of course to keep the water out, he had to caulk it with what? Pitch. So verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now he didn't say pitch it with pitch, he said to kipper it, cover it with pitch, inside and without. The Hebrew sacrificial term occurs in Genesis 6.14. And of course, you know what you do with pitch. You cover wood with it. In this case, it's a covering. Then we see another literal use of the term, which later, centuries later, under Moses, came to be the sacrificial term, is Genesis 32, 20. And here's the case where Jacob got Esau's birthright, and Esau didn't like that and threatened his life, and so Jacob fled. And Jacob spent several years getting wives way off in the east. And one day on his way back, many years later, he heard that Esau, who had now become a powerful man in his own right, was coming to meet him. And of course, he feared that Esau was going to kill him. So he said, take presents. And so he started sending presents to Esau while he was way off. He would send runners, you know, with presents before they ever met the two groups of people converging on one another. In Genesis 32, 20, he said, When you take the presents to Esau, say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face, peradventure he will accept me. Now he didn't say, I'll appease him. He said, I will cover his eyes with these presents. And it's kipper again. In other words, he'll cover over his eyes in the sense that he will cover over his wrath. He will appease him. He'll appease his wrath. But the term is not appease, but kipper again. Those are literal uses of the word which Moses, centuries later, 
God through Moses, of course, makes the central sacrificial term. It's the big term in sacrifice. To make atonement, well, if you understand what you mean by the word atonement, but it doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible, Old or New Testament. It's translated many times that way in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament in Romans chapter 5, but there it's the Greek word for make reconciliation. And it's not atonement. There's no such word in Greek for atonement. That is a word that needs to be explained. It's all right to use it if you mean by it the covering over of your sins and being reconciled to God. Because that's what it means in the literal Hebrew. And it means the same thing in Arabic, which is what we call a cognate language. It's a sister language. It means the same thing to cover or hide in the other language of the Near East that's akin to Hebrew. So that's the central term for sacrifice. Now we come to the classification of Levitical sacrifices. If you look at your outline now, you'll see under A, the national sacrifices. That is, national means on behalf of the nation. B, the official sacrifices, and those are the ones offered for the priests and the rulers, like kings and princes. And we'll explain all this later. C, the personal sacrifices for the individual, which were of two type, blood offerings and bloodless offerings. Why not just one sacrifice? Because you can't say it all in one sacrifice. What God's trying to teach us, and I carefully don't say what's trying to teach Israel. He's trying to teach us. Many things, like the awful nature of sin, requires the death of an innocent substitute, among other things he's trying to teach us. And the various sacrifices teach purity and fellowship and peace with God and consecration and many things. I mean, they literally taught those things, and the Israelites understood that. But the national sacrifices are sacrifices offered for the nation as a whole. The official sacrifices, the reason that you had to have different sacrifices is because a priest could become unclean where a mere individual or the nation wouldn't. See, a priest was set apart during his period of service to holiness. It was ritualistic and ceremonial holiness, but if he accidentally touched something unclean, he became unclean and couldn't serve at God's altar or serve God until he was cleansed. But a person might touch the same thing and not become unclean. I'm not trying to give specific instances how, but the point is a priest had to have special offerings. If he sinned, he might accidentally touch a dead body. And he couldn't serve if he did, so he'd have to offer certain sacrifices. Then the offerings for rulers. Since rulers were leaders, their sins were greater crimes against God. And they required special sacrifices. And they usually had to offer a whole lot more than an individual. And then personal sacrifices, of course. So they're divided up for a purpose. Now it just stands to reason that God would not require all of this in the Old Testament, hundreds of thousands, yea, millions of sacrifices, the death of animals, innocent victims, and have a complicated ritual. We'll see a little later there was a six-fold ritual that went with every sacrifice. Unless he was trying to say something. Why didn't he just keep everyone in the dark until Jesus came and Jesus could say, well, read Isaiah 53. Why do we need the Pentateuch? Read Isaiah 53. It prophesies of me as the suffering servant. I've come to give my life a ransom for many. But you see, when he came, the first thing God said through John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, which doesn't mean anything to the man out on the street who's lost. Behold the Lamb of God. What do you mean, Lamb of God? You mean God still sacrifices lambs? Or whatever. Now the classification of sacrifices are threefold. National, official, personal, as we've said. First of all, the national sacrifices. The national sacrifices, first are the cereal offerings. Like the series of something. And as you see from the outline, there were daily, weekly, and monthly offerings. Now every day, we'll tell you what was offered. Every day, the daily offering, morning and evening, a burnt offering on behalf of Israel. Now you run into this all through the Old Testament. So now you can understand why. When they speak of continual burnt offering, they mean it was offered every day. Our whole burnt offering, our daily burnt offering. It was a lamb a year old with meal and drink offerings. It's a lamb a year old. And because it's daily, it's called continual, as we've said. 
And then every Sabbath, morning and evening, a daily burnt offering, but it was doubled. It was doubled. Now because I don't have all the scripture texts for all the things I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give you any because it's more important you have the outline than all of the places where it's found in the Bible. You can probably look them up yourself. So every Sabbath, the daily burnt offering was doubled. Then every month, on the new moon, the first of the month, the new moon, it's called the new moon offering, there were offered two bullocks, a ram, and seven lambs. Two bullocks, a ram, and seven lambs. With meal and drink offerings again. Secondly, on that same day, the regular daily burnt offerings. And then a sin offering also, thirdly. Thirdly, a sin offering. A kid, a goat, a kid goat, sacrifice for a sin offering. That's the new moon Sabbath. Remember the woman in the Old Testament, Elijah prophesied a son for her. She had the son, then he died. And she told one of her servants to saddle a donkey and she was going to go to find Elijah up in Mount Carmel. And her husband said to her, why are you going to see the prophet? It's not a Sabbath, nor a new moon. See? And so it helps you to understand when he said that to her that that was a special day. Because if you don't know these technicalities of the Old Testament, you just think, well, a new moon, what does that mean? It doesn't mean a thing to you. Unless you've got an almanac and then it'll mean the wrong thing. <laughs> because that's our cult. And then for completeness sake, though it comes under another heading, there's the new moon of the seventh month. You ought to put it under that, the new moon Sabbath, the monthly new moon, and then there's a new moon of the seventh month, but that comes under another heading. But you need it here for completeness sake under the serial offerings because it follows a series. That's the cereal offerings, then two under the national sacrifices, the festal offerings. That means festival, holidays, holy days, festivals, feasts, festal offerings, F-E-S-T-A-L. The festal offerings fall under two heads, as you notice, the Passover cycle, three feasts, and the cycle of the seventh month, three feasts. Now the Passover cycle of feasts, these are still national sacrifices, was the Lord's Passover. You remember Exodus 12, the Passover lamb? An unblemished lamb or kid was slain. This is the Lord's Passover. On the 14th of Nisan, now that's given in the Old Testament, Nisan, N-I-S-A-N. The Jewish calendar is a little complicated because they have a civil year that starts on a different month and a religious year that starts on another month and Nisan is the first month of the religious new year and on the 14th of the month the first month you see if you go back and read Exodus 12 you'll see that God said this will be the beginning of months for you but later on we see other datings and we see that they had two calendars always going one was a religious calendar for the religious observances. The other was not a Gregorian calendar because that invention came later and it's not very accurate. That's why you've got leap years and all that. But they did have a civil calendar. But if you've got a calendar with so-called religious holidays on it, some of them happen to be Jewish, Yom Kippur, but you also get St. Valentine's Day with those calendars. But anyway, that's the idea. The Jews had two calendars. In other words, the religious calendar would be superimposed on the civil, but they would not coincide. So you have to keep that in mind, because we'll see a little later when they talk about the Jewish New Year. Today, they're talking not about this religious New Year, they're talking about the civil New Year. You remember what it's called? Hanukkah, yes. Hanukkah. You've heard that. You hear it all the time. That's the Jewish. We'll get to that a little later. That's another month. My wife said you ought to tell it. We heard it on the radio, so I will. Heard somebody really blowing up sales for St. Valentine's Day. And she said, oh, bless her heart. She said, St. Valentine's Day 
is an oasis in the midst of the depression between Christmas and Easter. <laughs> in other words, the poor people can hardly make it from Christmas to Easter, so they've inserted a St. Valentine's Day to help them make it through. So Valentine's Day is an oasis in the midst of the depressing times and feelings you have between Christmas and Easter. So the 14th of Nisan, the Lord's Passover, the second feast of the Passover cycle is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that begins on the 15th of Nisan, the next day, and lasted seven days. You see, as you read the text, it's rather complicated, and people get confused over the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They're not the same things, but they're connected. The first day, the 14th of the first month, religiously, is Nisan. On the 14th day, they sacrifice the Passover. And of course, they continue to do that all down through history, even down to Jesus' day. Remember, he ate the Passover with them. He said, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, fulfilling the type of it. And then after the Passover, which was a solemn feast, the next day began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened, no leaven in the bread, and it lasted seven days. And the first and last days were Sabbaths of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. No work, you were to rest. And so every day there were burnt offerings, the daily burnt offerings. And during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, after the burnt offerings, then two bullocks, a ram, and seven lambs. Two bullocks, a ram, and seven lambs every day with meal and drink offerings in addition to a kid offered for a sin offering. And then the third feast of the Passover cycle was, anyone know? It's Pentecost. Pentecost. The third feast in the Passover cycle, Pentecost. You see, all those feasts went together. Fifty days after Passover came the feast of Pentecost. And it lasted one day. That's all it had to last because that's when the Holy Ghost came. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's a big one to us. The Jews didn't know what it signified yet, but it was a big one to us. Isn't it interesting that it came on Pentecost? Have you figured out why? Well, let's wait till we get to it. Because we deal with the sacred seasons under another head. But you need to know the Feast of Pentecost is called many things in the Bible, and people, if they don't know they're all the same thing, won't know what they are. It's called the Feast of Harvest. It's called the Feast of First Fruits. It's called the Feast of Weeks. And it's called Pentecost. Feast of Harvest, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. The daily burnt offering. And in addition, were peace offerings and sin offerings on Pentecost. The burnt offering was every day, regardless of what the occasion was. When we get to the meaning of it, you'll see why. Out of all the offerings, there was one that God required every day, every day, every day, twice a day, on down through centuries and centuries, every day. If you offered nothing else, if no one came with a sin offering, you still offered the burnt offering. The priests did. The continual burnt offering. So you had peace offerings, sin offerings, burnt offerings, and the meal offering with it. Then the cycle of the seventh month, that's still under the festal offering, you know, the feasts. The cycle of the seventh month. And the big heading is national offerings. Three important feasts here. First of all, the feasts of the ram's horn, or the trumpets. And that was, da-da-da-da-da, the New Year. <laughs> they blew the trumpet. It was Hanukkah, the New Year. It's the civil New Year, not the religious. That's Tisri, T-I-S-R-I. Tisri, T-I-S-R-I, the month Tisri. And the first day of that month is the civil New Year. And it was a feast day. 
And it's also, since it's on the first of the month, the new moon of the seventh month that we gave you a while ago. We said there's a new moon of the seventh month that goes under the new moon Sabbath. It's called the Feast of the Trumpets. The new moon of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. This is the one they celebrate. You don't hear the Reformed Jews over here talking so much about Yom Kippur because, well, there's no altar, no sacrifice, no temple. And most of them, they don't really believe in their Old Testament. Anyway, just the Orthodox Jews. And they're just a handful in comparison. Now the offerings on the new moon of the seventh month. Besides a daily burnt offering, And the new moon offering that you would offer anyway on a new moon, besides the burnt offering and the new moon offerings we've already given you, would be an additional offering of a bullock, a ram, and seven lambs again. It's always a bullock, a ram, and seven lambs in these special cases. The second cycle, feast, or day, to be noted is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. And it was held on the tenth day of the seventh month. The Day of Atonement on the tenth day of the seventh month. Of course, that is the big day in Israel. A day of fasting and repentance. And the offering of sacrifices. For the priesthood, the priest, before he could offer any sacrifices for the people, were still under national offerings, the nation, he had to first offer for himself. He offered a bullock and a ram for a sin offering. The high priest for himself and the priesthood. A bullock and a ram for a sin offering. And for the congregation, the people, there were offered two goats and a ram. And the two goats are very significant with respect to Christ's sacrifice, and we deal with them later under the sin offering. The goat for Azazel. Some of you have asked when or if we deal with it. Yes, we will. Those two goats are very significant in the atonement of Jesus Christ. But the tenth day of the seventh month was the day of atonement. Or Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. The third feast, our third important day in that cycle is the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. It also is called other things. That's the Feast of Booths. B-O-O-T-H-S. A booth. And Jews today, whether they believe in the Old Testament or not, you'll see them, many if not most, will participate in this because this was the big Feast of Joy. The Feast of Booths. And they built a little booth in their driveway or in their yard of leaves, palm leaves if they can get them, and branches and have their feast out there. And it's on the 15th day of the seventh month. It's called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Tabernacles. And we'll explain the meanings in detail when we deal with the holy days, Sabbaths. No point in dealing with them twice. But the reason they stayed in booths and still do is it commemorates their wilderness wanderings when they had to live in tents, our tabernacles, our booths. This is the 15th day of the seventh month, as we said. Now, the sin of Israel had been removed by the offerings on the Day of Atonement, and so this is the last and greatest festival in Israel, and it lasted an entire week. Seventy bullocks were offered together with the regular burnt offering. Seventy bullocks were offered in an ascending scale, like two the first day, three the next, and six the next, until he got up to seventy, whatever it would be. The Feast of Booze. And by the way, that's the only one mentioned that will be in the millennium. In Zechariah chapter 14, it says, We will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That is the big feast in Israel. That's their time of rejoicing and feasting, like the love feast in the church. 
And that is said to continue out there in the millennium, the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booze. Remember God said if anyone doesn't go up to the Feast of Tabernacles, he'll cut off rain, cut off their blessing. It's the Feast of Rejoicing. And so it properly belongs to the millennium for the Christian, for the believer. Certainly we know that Ezekiel 40 to 48 speaks of sacrifices of various kinds for Israel, but Israel is restored in the millennium. And the sacrificial ritual and so forth, these things have different meanings in the millennium than they did in Israel's day as she was looking toward the cross. These will be looking back. And significant, there's no sin offering in the millennium. And some people, you know, can't understand how there can be sacrifices in the millennium. Well, the Bible says there will be. God spent eight chapters of highly detailed instruction saying how things were to be carried out during the millennium with respect to Israel. When the land's restored to her and the kingdom restored to her and so on. But the Feast of Tabernacles will pertain to us. It'll be a feast of rejoicing. Or we could say to everybody there. Then we come to the offerings of the holy place. We're still under national offerings, the offerings for the service of the holy place. Well, I'll just briefly mention these. The holy oil was supplied by the people. They had to bring pure olive oil to burn in the lampstand that stayed in the holy place. That's Leviticus 24, 1 to 4 on the holy oil. Incense had to be brought for burning daily upon the golden altar in the holy place. And then thirdly, there were the offerings of showbread. The showbread, our King James shewbread. S-H-O-W, showbread laid before the Lord. We've already given you the meaning of that. And the technical term. It's called the table of his presence, not the table of showbread. I don't know where showbread ever came from. It isn't in the Hebrew. If you go back in your notes, you see we gave it to you, the table of his presence, which signified his presence and provision in Israel. That's also Leviticus 24, verses 5 to 9. And only the priests could eat that bread. Then the extraordinary offerings, extraordinary, if you want to Americanize it, extraordinary offerings, these constituted exceptional national sacrifices. And they occur throughout the Old Testament. We just mentioned them because they're a part of sacrifices. Like at the erection of the tabernacle and temple, there were national offerings offered that would fall under this. You know, nothing required in the book of Leviticus, but these were special offerings that the people desired to make. At the consecration of Aaron, there were special sacrifices. Another offering was the offering of the mirrors of the Hebrew women to make that big brazen laver that the priests cleanse themselves in symbolically. The mirrors, that was an offering made to the Lord. There was a sin offering offered at the sin of Achan. Remember way back at the time of Jericho when he stole things out of Jericho and had to be stoned. Sin offerings. Those are special offerings. And there are others we could mention, like rebellion of Korah and so forth. They're not things required so much, except in the case of Aaron, it was. Not required so much as offerings that the nation made for special occasions. Then the official sacrifices. That's a second heading now. First, the priestly offerings. There would be a special sin offering for a priest who had accidentally erred in the discharge of his duties. If he'd made a mistake or touched something unclean, ritually unclean, and so on. Or any sin he committed, he had to offer a special sin offering before he could serve again. You might look at Leviticus 4.3 on that. But as I say, I'm not trying to give you scripture on all this. Then the daily offering of meal by the high priest, morning and evening. See, the priests had to offer a meal offering every morning and evening. Leviticus 6.14. These are priestly sacrifices for them, 
The Day of Atonement began with the priest offering a sin offering for himself and all the priests, Leviticus 16, which we just mentioned. The Day of Atonement, the priest had to atone for himself before he could atone for the sins of the people. Leviticus 16. And then when priests were consecrated, offerings were made. Any priest, high priest or Levite, there were special sacrifices had to be made at their consecration, our setting apart. Then the next classification under the official sacrifices, the offerings for rulers, kings, princes, those in leadership, civil leaders. And they were elaborate offerings generally. Sin offerings were made for rulers according to Leviticus 4, 22 to 26. And then like at the dedication of the temple or the tabernacle or when David returned the ark to Jerusalem, there were tremendous thousands of sacrifices offered on these occasions by the rulers. That brings us to the third category, the personal sacrifices for individuals. There are two types, and that's what we'll deal with in detail when we get through this. The personal sacrifices were blood sacrifices, which constituted four kinds. Blood sacrifices, four kinds. Burnt offering, peace offering, sin offering, and trespass offering. And then the bloodless sacrifices or offerings, the bloodless, are the what are called vegetable offerings, the grain and unleavened cakes and so forth. Two types of offerings, the blood sacrifices and the bloodless. Now, to get your thinking straight, there are five kinds of offerings. And they're laid out, one, two, three, four, five, in the book of Leviticus. The first one is the burnt offering, the meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, trespass offering. But see, one of those is a bloodless offering, and that's why we gave them under two headings. But there are actually five kinds of offerings. If we dare assign you something, we assign you the book of Leviticus for reading for next time. In every blood sacrifice, there was an important ritual that had to take place or the offering would not be accepted. There was a six-fold ritual. And it would vary a little in some of the sacrifices, of course, as we'll show you. The six-fold ritual is this. First of all, there's the presentation of the substitute, the animal. There's a presentation of the substitute victim. Two, there's the laying on of hands on the head of the substitute by the sinner or the person who makes the offering. There's the laying on of hands. Third, there's the slaying of the animal. And I dare say, if you'll read carefully Leviticus, you'll find out that you've been wrong all these years about who killed sacrifices in Israel. Unless you've been reading ahead of us, I dare say there isn't a person in the audience that knows who killed the sacrifice. The priests didn't kill the sacrifices. We'll just tell you that much. And there's a reason for that. It wasn't his sin. And we'll see why that the person who offered the sacrifice had to do the killing. He wouldn't soon forget, would he? You know, what sin required. Well, let's don't get ahead of the story. Fourth, the sprinkling of the blood on the altar for a covering of the sin. The fourth step. And in those four steps, they're the same in all. They would have to be. The fifth step, the burning of the sacrifice upon the great altar. The burning of the sacrifice. It was offered to God on the altar after the blood was manipulated on the horns or the sides of the altar, depending on the nature of the sacrifice where the blood went. Now, in the whole burnt offering, it was all burned, obviously, but in other sacrifices, only the fat 
the best part. You can never eat the fat of a sacrifice, the best part. Now, not best to you, maybe. <laughs> you trim it all off your meat. But if you've got good meat, it goes right along with it. You see, I used to be in the food business. That's why I say people today, for the most part, don't know what food is. But we won't get off into that. You see, the best beef is marbled with fat through it. It might look better to you, real red and bright and beautiful, but generally it'll be tough and not as good. But anyway, over in the Near East, even today, they don't run out and kill a sheep and have meat on the table all the time. We're the only people who eat meat three times a day. Just about the truth. We're the only people in the world. And so when they would slay an animal, see, part of the sacrifices they ate, maybe I'm getting too far ahead. Maybe I ought to wait till we get there. But some of the sacrifices, somebody ate it the priest or the people or whatever, but they couldn't keep the fat for themselves. So they had to give the best to God. So that's when we say the burning of the sacrifice, it doesn't mean the whole animal was burnt. That's only in the whole burnt offering. In the others, the whole animal is never burnt. When we get the sin offering, we'll see it was the most holy of all of them, and only the priest could eat it. So if it was supposed to be a type of Christ and sinful, he couldn't touch it. You know, JDS trying to make Jesus a sinner? No, the type of Christ, the sin offering, was pure and holy. And only the priest could touch it. And he got to eat it. Well, he had to eat it. Because it was the same as God accepting it and eating it. But that didn't bother them because that was their tithes and offerings. And that's the way they made their living. Were supported. So the burning of the sacrifice, or whatever part of it. And then sixthly, if it was to be a part of it, the sacrificial meal, which occurred in the peace offering, the sacrificial meal. Now, of course, in the whole burnt offering, there was no sacrificial meal, obviously, because it was all burnt. Now, we'll deal with the material of the offerings, under six, the material of the offerings. Now, you'll have to turn to Leviticus 11 to have any understanding about what we mean about this. Now, the reason you need to read this is because we've got people, charismatics, who say you can't eat pork, and they're getting it right out of Leviticus 11. Apparently they've never read the New Testament. And God makes here religious distinctions between clean and unclean animals. He said, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, what parts the hoof? Well, a pig does. Bacon, ham, Ooh, I have my bacon every day. Thank God I've read the New Testament. <laughs> We've got a lot of people can't eat pork. Christians under bondage. So whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed <laughs> and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat it. It had to do both of those things. Now a pig doesn't chew a cud. Cow chews a cud. What kind of a hoof does it have? Cloven. That's why they could be offered on the altar, you see. But you dare not offer a pig. In fact, the way the altar was defiled back between the Testaments is that Antiochus Epiphanes, remember, offered a pig on the altar. It had to be cleansed by the Maccabees. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because it cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney. Now what's a coney? Well, not really. It looks like a rabbit, and maybe it belongs to the rabbit family, but it's a little brown creature that isn't over here. It's over in the Near East, and they know what it is. <laughs> well, I want to show you something here a minute. See, the next verse says, the hare, that's a rabbit. So he wouldn't have rabbit in both cases. So it's like a rabbit, but not a rabbit. For the technical name, the coney is a hyrax, H-Y-R-E-X, if that helps. I think coney is better. But the coney chews the cud, but divideth not the hoof, so he's unclean to you. And the hare, see, here's your rabbit, because it cheweth the cud also, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. And the swine, though he divideth the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. So he is unclean to you. Now the interesting thing is about these people who won't eat pork, most of them, 
never occurs to them that there's anything unclean about a rabbit. They eat rabbit. You see, only some of the Adventists quit eating meat altogether. You know, totally legalistic. But there are a lot, I've met some of the charismatics, at least two cases I can remember. One time, sat at the table where we were eating and he wouldn't eat meat. What bondage. I just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit so I didn't try to straighten him out. I was just too happy. <laughs> you know, I was ignoring him, but I wasn't trying to start trouble. We were at a retreat and all of that. They never think. Catfish, oysters, clams, rabbit. We can name a lot of things they do eat and don't know. You know, that it's forbidden in the Old Testament. If you're going to follow one rule, then follow it all. Well, he says the swine, and that's the only verse they pick out, the pig. Of their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcass shall you not touch. They are unclean to you. These shall you eat of all that are in the waters. Now he comes to the fish. Whatsoever has fins and scales in the waters, seas and the rivers, you shall eat. And all that doesn't have these things, verse 10, you shall not eat. They shall be an abomination unto you. See, that's oysters or whatever. It has to have fins and scales. And there's a reason for that again, we'll point out. They shall be an abomination unto you, verse 11. You shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination to you. You notice he takes four verses on that. He's trying to get these people off of shrimp and snails and eels, all these yucky things people eat. <laughs> Although they have gotten me, if they bred it, to taste shrimp. <laughs> That's another story. But anyway, it's not unclean anymore. It just looks that way to me. <laughs> I got no problem religiously. It's just dietetically. But I've gotten to the place where you get in Florida or somewhere where you can get fresh shrimp breaded. I still don't know so anybody can eat those grub worms out of a bowl <laughs> with a little sauce on them. Or oysters. I said, aren't they even cooked? No, they just swallow those things. They're staring right back at you. Big oyster eye. And, and you don't know what you've eaten if you ate one because it goes down so quick. I like pan-fried oysters. See, I'm not legalistic. I've been delivered, but <laughs> boy, I'll tell you, some of the things that people mention eating, I can see why God said it was an abomination to Israel. <laughs> well, anyway, he spent a long time with the fish, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and only one verse on the pigs. Wonder why that these people love those catfish dinners. There are no scales or fins on a catfish. They're unclean. And of course, part of the reason is you can already see a catfish will eat off the bottom. He'll eat junk, filth, whatever. Well, anyway, he spent four verses on the fish, and they eat the fish. Well, these are they which you shall have in abomination among the fowls. Now he comes to the birds. You shall not eat things that are like the eagle, the ossifrage, the osprey, the vulture, the kite, the raven, the owl, the hawk, swan, pelican, stark. Stark's always unclean in Scripture. The lapwing, the bat. I can't imagine people eating a bat, but people eat mice in some cultures. I hear the Chinese like them. I know people do eat mice. They do eat mice and rats. Well, now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I want to have you read it, but I want to sum it up for you and what the significance of these religious distinctions in foods are. And they should not be carried over into the New Testament. Now, first of all, let's deal with the classification of clean and unclean animals for food, and then secondly, for sacrifice. And you'll see that if it was unclean for food, it was also unclean for sacrifice. You couldn't offer it to God. So the classification of clean and unclean for food, four classifications. Large land animals, water animals, and birds, and then small animals. Now of the larger animals, the clean, God said, are those who chew the cud 
and divide or part the hoof. They have to do both of those things. The camel chews the cud, but it doesn't have a cloven hoof, so it's unclean. The camel, the rabbit, the pig are types of unclean things. Of the water animals, the clean are those that have scales and fins. Now, while a fish may eat your worm, that isn't his diet. You fed him that. And we'll see a little later the distinctions of clean and unclean foods are God said only the clean animals and fish and so forth are those who are not carnivorous, who don't eat other flesh, because blood's an abomination to God in the Old Testament, because he was going to offer the blood on the altar, you see, and it had to be sacred, set apart. And so of the water animals, those who had scales and fins. So that eliminates catfish dinners, as we've said, the eels, the shellfish, and so on, were unclean to Israel. Of the birds, there's no general classification as to what constitutes an unclean or clean bird, but it's pretty apparent, as I'll show you. There are 20 named in Leviticus and 21 in Deuteronomy that are unclean. And the ones that are unclean are generally those that are birds of prey, like the hawk will eat mice, the eagle, birds of prey. Waiters, waiters that eat living things. You know, the waiters in the edge of the rivers, pelicans and flamingos and so forth. They eat fish and whatever they can grab up that's living. So it would be birds of prey, waiters, and the bat and the stark are always unclean. The bat in anybody's book and the stark in the Old Testament. <laughs> They've actually got such weird ideas today that they're even talking about trying to think good toward the bat. All sorts of weird things because of all this monster comics and emphasis. Batman, you know. But I mean seriously, they're saying the bat isn't such a bad fellow after all. Well, you can have them. Then of the small animals, this is a fourth classification of small creatures, the grasshopper alone could be eaten. It was clean. Now you might not think so. <laughs> I see somebody already acting like they wouldn't like a diet of grasshoppers. Well, you're not John the Baptist. He lived on locusts and wild honey. And locusts are a delicacy, they say. I don't want to try them either, but the point is, they were clean. And no doubt it was a special type locust. Not the grasshopper that spits tobacco juice that you're familiar with. <laughs> you ever picked one up, that brown stuff on you? Tobacco juice? It's what we used to call it. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it isn't that that they ate. It was a special type locust. You remember the Gospels? John the Baptist. His diet was locusts and wild honey. How would you like a diet like that? That would eliminate all those good things that you're going to go home and eat. If you're like me, you don't eat before you speak. Sparkling cider. <laughs> Non-alcoholic, folks. Something new somebody introduced me to. Sparkling cider. It reminds me of the good old days. <laughs> I'm talking about the days when food was food. I actually found some old-fashioned bologna the other day. But I'm not going to share with anybody. <laughs> After that reaction on real peanut butter. But see, John, he had none of that. Well, it says on the bottle, non-alcoholic. For those of you still with that, I left that. Sparkling cider. You can buy it in Warsaw. It's not alcoholic. Some of you, if you don't live the abundant life, probably can't afford it. We buy it by the case. It's like two fifty a bottle. And it's better than 7-Up and better for you. It's apple juice. 
Some people don't know what cider is. It's not hard cider. It says on the bottle, non-alcoholic. <laughs> All right, now let's leave that. John couldn't enjoy any of that. Where were we? And of those things that crawl and creep, none were allowed. That includes snails. Anything that crawls and creeps was unclean, an abomination to God. Now, the French like snails, but maybe that explains some other things. Now, the reason for this distinction of foods, why would God make such a distinction? Okay, we're going to give it to you right out of the Word of God. Turn to Leviticus 20. See, this will help you in your reading since we're dealing with these things. Leviticus 20. Why the distinction in foods? No other culture in the world, including the U.S. of America, has any food distinctions. They eat everything. Rattlesnake even. They can't rattlesnake. That was an abomination, any creeping or crawling thing. All right, Leviticus 20, verse 23. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all of these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I said unto you, You shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you, from other people. Now get the message. He separated them from every other nation. And that will explain the next verse. You shall therefore put a difference between clean beasts and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. And you shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, and you shall be mine. Now he keeps repeating, they're distinct, they're separated, they're separated from all other nations. And so the principle in the clean and unclean foods is not that anything's unclean in itself, as we see in the New Testament. Now that doesn't mean you can eat rats because anyone knows a rat's unclean, but it isn't religiously unclean. You see what I mean? We're talking about religious distinction. The principle is this, that Israel was to impress upon every sphere of life the fact that she was a people separated from the world unto God. That was the only reason, but that was the big reason. That was the real reason. That's the reason for the religious distinctions on foods. Therefore, when they came over to the New Testament under grace, and people still try to make religious distinctions about food, like the Adventists and some of the Charismatics you'll meet occasionally, who have a spirit of bondage about foods, they don't even know why God did it. They use this old silly argument, well, pork won't keep over in the Near East. You know, it's hot over there. Well, neither will camel. Our rabbit. You ever smell a rabbit the second day if you didn't refrigerate it? Well, that's nonsense because you could cook pork and keep it as long as you could cook anything else. And they don't even know the reason. They're bound by a spirit. The reason was not because food's unclean in itself, because the New Testament says that all foods are clean. And says you can eat what you want if you've got faith. And so the reason is that God in every way, even their dresses we'll see later, had borders on the garment. They wore phylacteries with scriptures written on them, put them on the doorpost, on their head, on their arm. In every way they were saying to the world, we are a holy people separated unto God. And even the food we eat, we don't eat a lot of this filth. It is filthy in itself, like a catfish out of Ohio River. You'd be crazy to eat it. Well... You wouldn't be crazy necessarily, but you might get crazy after eating <laughs> because of what's in the Ohio River. And it lives off of this stuff that comes out of the toilets and everything else. Dead things. 
So think of that the next time you enjoy that catfish supper. <laughs> but actually, those catfish come out of a pond. Someone has raised them. They were not going to eat everything everyone ate. They were not going to dress like everyone dressed. Remember, God criticizes the way women dress in the Old Testament. That isn't just New Testament to dress modestly. That's Old Testament. And when they dress like the harlots or the women down in Egypt, Amen. we've got criticism of that. And we won't even get off yet into not wearing things that pertain to a man. But anyway, in every way, God made them a distinctive people. In their sacrificial ritual, in the cleansing of the priest, no priest in the other culture had to go through ritualistic cleansing, ceremonial cleansing, and so on. And so in conclusion to this idea, it's the flesh-eating animals that would seem to be unclean. Though God doesn't spell it out in so many words, it seems to be the flesh-eating animals are birds of prey, are even birds like a sparrow or robin, say, that eats worms. That would be unclean, you see. Of the small animals, anything that had a repulsive look to it. You know, creeping, crawling things. Crabs. Crabs are really repulsive. Look at I used to live in Florida. Snakes and snails. Then of the animals acceptable for sacrifice. Well, you can guess, of course, think ahead, that it isn't going to be anything that's unclean, will it? So of the clean animals fit for sacrifice to God on his altar, it would be this, domesticated cattle, sheep, and goats. See, be your own cattle, sheep, and goats. For the poor doves and pigeons, and of course they would be raised, doves and pigeons would be allowed for the poor. You could offer no animal taken in hunting on the altar of God. No wild animal. No animal taken in hunting. Deer, wild goat, or whatever. It had to be domesticated out of their flocks and herds. It had to belong to them. You had to give what belonged to you, or it isn't a sacrifice. No fish. That's interesting. No fish on God's altar, even though certain fish are clean with scales and fins. But one of the Leading religions they would run into in Israel would be the worship of Dagon, D-A-G-O-N, Dagon, which was the fish god. He was shaped like a fish. That is, instead of feet, he had a tail like a fish and a head like a man. So no fish on the altar. They had to be at least eight days old, is another point. At least eight days old, or else they're unclean. Now why that distinction, you suppose? Well, first of all, it would be easier to kill, only eight days old. Say a calf, it would be very small, it would be easier to kill. It would be easier to burn on the altar. Think of the thousands of sacrifices, and they tried to offer somebody's prize heifer weighing 3,000 pounds and take all day to burn it. And remember, except in the whole burnt offering, only the fat was offered anyway. But then in the burnt offering, it would include that. People offered burnt offerings. See, the continual burnt offering the priests offered, that every day, God required that. But you, the Israelite, they were constantly offering burnt offerings. We'll see why, because of what it signifies. It was one of the most blessed offerings to offer. So it had to be eight days old. It was easier to kill, easier to burn, and easier to eat, because most of the sacrifices were eaten by somebody. Now, just in way of completing that idea before we mention briefly and then we'll conclude about the vegetable offerings, we'll give you about three texts. I'd like for you to turn at least to one or two of them that show that there are no more religious distinctions about meats and foods in the New Testament. These are not all the passages. Mark 7, 14 and following. Let's look at that one. Mark 7, 14 and following. And I'll give you a few more that you can look up on your own. And when you run into these people, and some of them are charismatic, if you please, who think they can't eat pork because it was prohibited in the Old Testament, 
You need to tell them that the New Testament has set them free, the new dispensation. Mark 7, 14 and following. And when he had called all the people unto him, Jesus said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand there is nothing without a man that entering into him can defile him. He's talking about eating foods. He's not talking about eating junk. He's just saying there are no religious distinctions anymore. There's nothing without that can defile you if you eat it. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Some of them haven't heard, have they? And when he was entered into the house, the disciples asked him concerning this parable. Why, he said, are you also without understanding? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into a man, it cannot defile him? Because it enters not into his heart, but into his stomach, and goeth out into the draught, or the toilet, literally, purging all meats. And people jump right on to what else he said and skip that little phrase that when he said that, he purged all meats. He did, even before we get over into the epistles where they're certainly purged in Romans and 1 Timothy and Colossians. So he said, nothing that you eat can defile you, thereby purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, and so on. But for our purpose, he cleansed meats by his teaching in that parable. Now Mark is writing later, after the cross, after the resurrection. The apostles didn't know what he meant. He had to explain it to them. And they weren't ready for the purging of all meats. You know, that had to come later. It took Peter all the way to Acts 10 to learn that the Gentiles, us, are clean if we believe. 1 Timothy 4 is a common passage that is to us, but we'll read it anyway. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. Now what are those seducing spirits teaching? What are these demonic doctrines? Well, verse 3, they forbid to marry and they command to abstain from meats. Your Catholics on Friday and your Adventists and these people that are bound by spirits of legalism, take note, forbidding to marry, this is a doctrine of a demon to tell you you have to abstain from meat. There's some I may not like because I don't like the looks of it, but it's not for religious considerations. In fact, if I have to prove it isn't, I'll eat it. But I don't have to prove it because I know when I'm free, like you know. But notice what he says, the meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by them which believe and who know the truth, which means they don't know the truth and they don't have faith. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for you cleanse it, sanctify it, consecrate it by the word of God and by prayer. If language means anything, there are no longer any legalistic, ceremonial, ritualistic distinctions to be bound with. God was trying to prove something to the world that Israel was a holy, separated people. He says so. You had it. I gave it to you. Leviticus 20. Well, another passage is Colossians 2.14, verses 20 to 22. 2.14 and verses 20 to 22. It says the same thing. And now, in conclusion tonight, we're still under the material of the offerings. Let's come to a brief mention of the vegetables or bloodless sacrifices. This consisted of three kinds, the bloodless sacrifices or offerings, we should call them offerings. First, it's grain roasted in fire, like parched corn or sunflower seeds, you know, that are parched and salted and ready to eat. In King James are called ears of corn, but the Jews knew nothing about corn. We got that from the Indians long after Israel. It's not ears of corn, but grains of wheat roasted in the fire. That was one type vegetable offering, meal offering. And then secondly was flour with which oil and frankincense was mixed. You added oil and incense to flour. And then a third 
bloodless offering was unleavened cakes. Unleavened cakes or unleavened bread, if you want to call it bread. Now the principle upon which the material of the offerings was fixed, the principle of these offerings was fixed. They were chosen, you'll notice, with regard to the ordinary nourishment earned by the people. The principle upon what the offerings were fixed, that would be blood and bloodless. They were chosen with regard to the ordinary food or nourishment earned by the people. That is, clean animals, domesticated animals they raised, and the produce from their fields. These alone can be offered on God's altar. What you produced with your hands are raised. And so the people, in offering their sacrifices and offerings, this is the principle. In bringing an offering to God of food produced by their own hands, and that would include animals, they first sanctify themselves, which the blood signifies. Regardless of what you offered, you had to offer a blood offering first. The blood had to be sprinkled on the altar. So they first sanctified themselves by offering that which they had raised with their own hands or produced. Then they sanctified their calling, which was shepherds and farmers in Israel. God never called them to be businessmen like the Jews are today. That's a part of their problem. It sanctified their calling. And thirdly, it testified to God's blessings upon the labor of their hands. Testified to God's blessing on the labor of their hands because, see, there were first fruits offerings, in gathering offerings of the grain. The first male of the flock belonged to God. It was given to Him. Our, some things could be redeemed with silver. But see, in all of this, these things were being shown and taught.